In the twilight days of the Cold War, on the warm spring evening of May 28, 1987, as the Soviet Union celebrated Border Guards Day, a light single-engine airplane landed gently at the very center of Moscow near Red Square. A tall man in a red jumpsuit climbed down from the cockpit and, smiling in a friendly fashion, began signing autographs for members of the public who came running up to him. Born on June 1, 1968, Matthias Rust was an inexperienced pilot with about 50 hours of flying experience at the time of his flight. He had single-handedly flown more than 500 miles through every Soviet defensive shield in his rented single-engine Cessna F-172P and landed at the gates of the Kremlin. The idea had come to him a year earlier while he was watching TV at his parents' home in Hamburg, West Germany. A summit held in Reykjavik, Iceland, on the 11th to 12th of October 1986 between the US President Ronald Reagan and General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, had ended in a stalemate, and the teenager who had a passion for politics felt that he wanted to do something to make a difference. Matthias wanted to create an imaginary bridge to the east, and his flight was intended to reduce tension and suspicion between the two Cold War sides. Many idealistic teenagers may have had similar fantasies of bringing about world peace by performing daring acts. The difference with Rust is that he actually went ahead with his plan. On May 13, 1987, he told his parents he was going to tour Northern Europe in a Cessna airplane in order to clock up hours towards his professional pilot's license. His first stop was in the Shetland Islands, then the Faroe Islands. Next came the capital of Iceland, Reykjavik then Bergen in Norway, before he arrived on the 25th of May at the Finnish capital, Helsinki. He spent several days there trying to decide if he really had the courage to go through with his plan. He had a good reason to be nervous. The USSR had the largest air defense system in the world. Less than five years earlier, a South Korean civilian airliner had been shot down after straying into Soviet airspace, causing the death of all 269 passengers on board. Nevertheless, he decided to accept the challenge. On the morning of May 28th, Rust refueled at Helsinki Malmi Airport. He told air traffic control that he was going to Stockholm and took off at 1221. Immediately after his final communication with traffic control, he turned his plane to the east. Back in Helsinki, operators at air control began to worry. Air traffic controllers tried to contact him as he was moving around the busy Helsinki-Moscow route but Russ turned off all his communications equipment. To make it even more terrifying for the air traffic controllers, Rust vanished from their radar screens. Control personnel presumed an emergency, and a rescue effort was organized, including a Finnish border guard patrol boat. They spotted a patch of oil on the sea surface and conducted an underwater search but did not find anything. While they were hunting for him, Rust was sitting snug in his cockpit as his plane crossed the Baltic coastline over Estonia and turned towards Moscow. At 1429, he appeared on Soviet Air Defense Forces radar and, after failure to reply to an IFF signal, was assigned combat number 8255. Three SAM battalions of the 54th Air Defense Corps tracked him for some time but failed to obtain permission to launch missiles at him. All air defenses were brought to readiness and two interceptors were sent to investigate. At 1448, Meek 23 pilot senior lieutenant Puchnin observed Rust's plane and asked for permission to engage, but was denied. Matthias was terrified when, instead of attacking him, the jet passed by and disappeared into the clouds. A combination of unbelievable luck and human error led to Rust's plane being mistaken for a friendly aircraft. A plane crashed the previous day, and an ongoing rescue operation, along with training for new pilots, had led to confusion in the air and control centers. Soviet air defense re-established contact with Rust's plane several times, but confusion followed all of these events. All of these happened because the Soviet air defense forces had shortly before been divided into several districts, which simplified management but created additional overhead for tracking officers at the district's borders. For example, the local air regiment near Peskov in northwestern Russia was on maneuvers, and due to inexperienced pilots' tendency to forget correct IFF designator settings, local control officers assigned all traffic in the area friendly status, including Rust. That's why Rust somehow managed to make it hundreds of miles across Soviet airspace to the capital without any further contact from USSR defense forces. I couldn't believe I actually survived, he recalled. But his relief at seeing the spires and domes of Moscow at around 19 o'clock that day quickly faded when he realized that landing was going to be difficult. 
He had wanted to bring down the plane in the middle of Red Square in order to make a big statement, but the landmark was packed full of people. On the ground, Soviet citizens were stopping and looking up in amazement as the small white plane circled just 30 feet above the ground. Finally, Russ spotted a four-lane bridge next to St. Basil's Cathedral, so he circled around one more time and touched down there. Matthias was extremely lucky because later when he was questioned by the Russian police, he learned that the bridge was usually spanned by thick cables, which would have made a landing impossible. By chance, they had been removed from the bridge that very morning for maintenance. So just as the sun was going down, Russ taxied his plane into the square and climbed out of the cockpit to greet the crowds, which gathered around him. They wanted to know where the young foreigner was from and why he was there. I'm here on a peace mission from Germany, Russ told them. When they shook his hand, glad to meet an ally, he had to explain that he came from the other Germany, West, not the Communist East, as they presumed. Once the police had recovered from the shock of finding an unauthorized aircraft parked at the gates of the Kremlin, Rust was arrested. He spent hours trying to persuade the authorities that he had acted alone and was not part of some sinister plot hatched by foreign governments. In the Kremlin, there was shock and plenty of red faces as the full extent of the humiliating incident became apparent. But it's likely that the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, realized he could use the opportunity to his advantage to rid himself of military officials whom he saw as standing in the way of his reforms. Within a couple of days, the Minister of Defense Marshal of the Soviet Union, Sergei Sokolov, had been forced to retire. Also, many other senior officers had been sacked, including the Commander-in-Chief of the Soviet Air Defense Forces, former World War II fighter ace pilot, Chief Marshal, Alexander Koldanov. Together, more than 150 people lost their jobs over the next few months. Russ trial began in Moscow on September 2, 1987. Matthias was charged and pleaded guilty to violating international flight rules and illegally crossing the Soviet border. The judge sentenced him to four years in a labor camp for what he called an act of adventurism. However, Matthias was never transferred to a labor camp and instead served his time at the high-security Lefartovo Temporary Detention Facility in Moscow. On December 8, 1987, Reagan and Gorbachev agreed to sign a treaty to eliminate intermediate-range nuclear weapons in Europe, and the Supreme Soviet ordered Russ to be released in August 1988 after serving only 14 months, as a goodwill gesture to the West. Matthias returned to Germany on August 3, 1988. He reported that he had been treated well in the Soviet prison. Today he makes his living as a financial analyst and a yoga instructor. He says he has no regrets about what he did and believes he had a hand in helping Mikhail Gorbachev with his reforms.